Welcome to the Time to Get Serial podcast, where the facts are worse than fiction. With for us, your humble host, Shin, Jija, Nui, and Jenny. For our first ever episode, we go to the world's most famous serial killer of all the time, Jack the Ripper. We also have the American serial killer, and repeat, Ted Bundy was one of the most notorious criminals of the late 20th century in episode 2. Follow with the story of Candyman, Dean's Cole once make a dead list, serial killer in episode 3. The cannibal celebrity, Issei Sagawa, in episode 4. Please stay tuned. In this episode, I will try to give my listeners as good a background on Victoria Ila London as possible. And of course, we'll start to take a closer look at Jack's handwork. This story begins at the crosslands of the White Chapel district on the east end of London. Mary Nicole, the first canonical victim. 31st August 1888 Mary Ann Nichols was a small woman in mid to early thirties. She had lived a colorful life, had been married for 24 years, and had had five children. After Mary's separations, she finally left her husband for good in 1881 and began living as a prostitute. She had turned to drink and was an alcoholic. Moving from workhouse to workhouse throughout London. After landing a job as a maid, she stole clothing from her employees and took flight back at the workhouses she had been so familiar with. In the early hours of August 31st, she had met her fellow prostitute, Emily Holland, working through White Chapel Street, on the corner of Offbourne Road, just a stone throw away from the scene of earlier attack victim, Emma Smith. She was apparently drunk and having some trouble supporting herself with the aid of the walls and told Emily she had had her dust money three times that day. but drank it all away. Ominously, she then told Emily that she will soon be back. It could be the last time we see her alive. At 2.45 a.m., Mary Ann Nicole's body was discovered by Shao Khan on Bucks Law, which he was on his way to work. Upon seeing the body, he called to his friend across the street. The two observed her and believed that she was possibly still beating. But what Nitterman has noticed in the piece darkness of Buck's soul was that the woman's toes has been slapped so sorry that her head had almost been cut from her body. At the inquest, her wounds were described. She had several bruises to her face and several cuts across her abdomen, along with three or four deeper cuts landing downward from her abdomen. She also had had her toes cut, causing two brutal wounds from her left ear to below her shin, 
with her several old tissue down to her water bay. The Reaper had given London a taste of what was to come. Mary Ann Nichols was poor and had no valuables to steal. Her killing was violence and senseless, and it would be not wrong before he would try again. Jack the Reaper's second victim, Annie Chapman, 8th September 1888. In the days following Mary Ann Nichols' murder, the press and local residents of Whitechapel had begun to panic, attributing the murder to that of a madman who had been able to vanish among the morning food traffic. Fear was keeping him. Annie Chapman was 47 years old. She was pretty, standing only 5 feet tall. In 1886, she took to prostitution to make her living. She resided at Crossingham Lodging House in Spaterfields and was seemingly in something of a stable relationship with a man named Edward Stanley who often prayed for her bed in Crossingham. On the morning of the 8th September, Annie Chapman was seen several times in the kitchen of her rustic house. She was drinking beer with Frederick Stevens, another Roger, around midnight. At 5.30 a.m., Annie was seen talking to a man at Hambury Street by Respect Long. The man had his back to was, a respect who said. She heard him ask Annie, Will you? To which Annie replied, Yes. Annie's body was found at 6 a.m., laying on the backyard of 29 Hungary Street, by a resident who lived on the third floor with his family. Annie's attacker had used a sharp knife to cut her throat. The wood was jacked as an air period to leash right around her neck. There was blood on the gown by her head and smears on the fence directly behind her. The murderer had then gone on to cut her abdomen keen open. Her intestines were removed and paired by her shoulder. Her utterant upper parts of her vagina and two-thirds of her bladder had also been removed. But... No trace of this past were left at the scene. As panic and fear sweep to each London, a new inspector was adopted in to take care of the master on the cow, Frederick Abeline. He was well respected, and one aspect of his appointment was thought to be to stabilize the public perception of the police at the time. There were many executions, suspects, and even at least almost three weeks passed before Jack Woods resurfaced, and this time, giving himself a name which would become infamous, the world over for over a hundred years. Jack the Reaper's Third Victim Elizabeth Strait 30th September 1888 Elizabeth Strait was a 45 years old Swedish woman. She had moved to London in 1866 and by 1888 was living in the lodging houses on Flower and Dean Street in Whitechapel, working as an occasional prostitute. On the night of 30 September, Elizabeth Strait was seen several times with a man of worrying description. So it is the testimony of Israel first. That is the most intriguing. He claims to have seen Elizabeth Strait at 12.45 a.m. with a man around 30 years of age, 5 foot 5 inches tall, with fresh complexion, dark hair, 
and a small brown mustache. He was draped in an old coat and an old fat back hat with a wide brim. The man had stopped to talk to Street in the gateway of that few yard, and to begin to quarrel. The man pulled her into the street and threw her into the ground. Schwartz crossed the street, thinking he was avoiding a domestic agreement and not wanting to become involved. There was a second man lighting his pipe on the side of the street, and a tracker hollowed. Appealingly, to this second man, Lipsky, she was relieved he was being followed by the second man, so ran away from the scene. Until the second man did not follow. At one a.m. Who is Dimitri? Found the body of Elizabeth dead. She was lying on the ground, head against the wall of yard, with her toes cut. Upon arrival of the police and Doctor Bagwell, the doctor noted that her body was still warm, and judged that by the severity of the cut to her toes. She would have bed to death in around one minute. Judging the timings, judging the timings, is it really likely that Mr. Elshwart was the only man to have seen Jack the Leper at the time of a murder? Is this also very possible that Jack had? Been in the yard at the same time as Louis Dimitri when he arrived, perhaps cutting his brutal killing short of any further mutilation. The same night, Catherine Adams, at almost the exact same moment that the body of Elizabeth's death was discovered in the field yard. Catherine Adler was being released from Big Chop Girls Police Station. Catherine Adler was a prostitute who has been released earlier that night for being drunk and disorderly, but has sobered up enough for the on-duty police officer to release her. She left the police station with a simple farewell. Good night, Ocox. At 1:30 a.m., P.C. Edward Watkins walked through Myers Square on his bridge and noticed nothing of any significance. Upon his return at 1:45 a.m., however, He saw the body of Catherine Adams lying on her back in a pool of blood, and with her coat pulled up about her waist. Catherine Edwards had had her throat cut, severing her arteries. Being the cause of her death, this was, however, not the full extent of her injuries. Her intestines had been removed and placed over her right shoulder. Two foot long prints and has been detected, and placed on the left hand side of her body. Her eyebrows had been cut off, her face mutilated, her eyelids, nose, and cheeks all stabbed and lined. Her abdomen had been cut completely open, and many of her organs had been stabbed or cut through, including her left kidney, which had been completely removed. All mutilations were done after her death. Following the night of the double murders, the police saw fit to release. 
to the public a letter, which they had received a few days. Five, higher on the twenty-seventh September, the letter was headed, "Dear Boss," and has become famous in history. Dear Boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught on to me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they look so clever and talk about being on the right track. That joke about leather aprons gave me real fits. I am down on whores, and I shan't quit ripping them till I get buckled. Grand work the last job was. I gave the lady no time to squeal. How can they catch me now? I love my work, and I want to start again. You will soon hear of me with my funny little games. I saved some of the proper red stuff in ginger beer bottles over the last job to write with, but it went thick like glue. And I can't use it. Red ink is fit enough. I hope. Ha <laughs> ha. The next job I do, I shall clip the lady's ear off and send it to the police officer, just for jolly, wouldn't you? Keep this letter back till I do a bit more work. Then give it out straight. My knife is so nice and sharp. I want to get back to work right away if I get the chance. Good luck. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Don't mind me giving a trademark name. Wasn't good enough to post this before I got all the red ink off my hands. Curse it! No luck yet. They say I'm a doctor now. Ha <laughs> ha. October 1888, calm state. The second most likely authentic correspondence from Jack to the police came on a postcard today, named the. Saucy Jackie, I was not cutting, dear old boss. When I gave you the tip, you'll hear more about Saucy Jackie's work tomorrow. Double event this time. Number one squealed. The bit couldn't finish straight off. Had not the time to get the air for the police. Thanks for keeping the last letter till I got back to work again, Jack the Ripper. On October sixteenth, from Hill. From Hell, Mister Lusk. Sorry, I send you half a kidney I took out from one woman. Preserved it. For you, tell their piece I fried and ate it was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out for you, if you only wait a while longer. Sign, catch me when you can, Mister Lusk. Jack the Lippers, final victim, Mary Kelly, 9th November, 1888. Mary Kelly was 25 years old. She was raised in Wales by a decent family and had a good education. She was married at the age of 16. Though two years later, her husband was killed in an explosion. She arrived in London in 1884. At 10:45 a.m., Mary Kelly landlord John McCarthy sent his assistant Thomas Boyer to Mary Kelly's room, collect the overdue rent. Inside, he saw blood on the bed and ran back to tell McCarthy of the scene. Mary Carey was laying naked on her bed. Her right arm had been partially detached. All the skin from her abdomen and left leg had been removed and placed on the bedside table. All organs along the bones of her base had been removed and placed along her body. Her uterus and kidneys, along with one blade, were under her head. The other beds were by her right foot. The liver was placed between her feet. The intestines were placed by the right side of her body, and the spleen by the left. Her face had suffered such mutilation that she was beyond recognition. Which parts of her nose, cheek, eyebrows, and eyes removed? The cause of her death had been a cut through her neck that has been so deep that it went down to her belly bear. The bone themselves notched from the bread. Suspects. The number of Jack the Ripper suspects now runs to well over a hundred. Some of them are highly possible contenders for the metal of Jack the Ripper. Others are just downright. Ridiculous. But let's take a look with Aaron Comiskey. Aaron Comiskey was a man 
believed to be by several high-ranking police officials at the time. One of the strongest suspects. However, many of their accounts do not totally with the man himself, nor indeed with each other. This behaviors and makeup seem to be prevalent in all official accounts of him as a suspect. This hardly people to question whether or not they all speak of the same man in the first place. And thus, great great doubt that he is a strong suspect at all. Regardless, with the high ranking police naming his all right, he requires some research. Arons was born in Lanshu of Poland and moved to London around 1881. He was 24 years old in 1888 and lived in White Chicago. By the later period of the 1880, he was thought to have been suffering from schizophrenia, was delusional and paranoid. He believed that he was spoken to by higher power, refused to watch, and every job that little by or to do to this paranoia of being fed. He was eventually committed to Kornihan's lunatic asylum in 1891. In 1894, he was transferred to Lewinstone Asylum, where he died in 1919. During this time in the asylum, he was never known as being violent. Interestingly, in 2014, Kuminski was named by author Rachel Edwards as definitively the Ripper. Edwards came to his conclusions through modern DNA evidence, which are documented in his book, Naming Jack the Ripper. The book has fascinating scientific details and the DNA extraction methods are interesting. However, the book's conclusions are hotly debated and largely unexpected as a whole. We await eagerly for the peer review of the rated DNA work. But until then, he remains a suspect with a rather muddled backstory. So, what do you think about this? Who is Jack the Ripper in this episode? Please share your idea and perspective below right here. We always wait for your comment. Before we go, let's have a look for all the vocabulary in this episode. Abdomen Abdomen Accusations Accusations Arteries Arteries Attributing Attributing Be prevalent. Be prevalent. Bladder. Bladder. Bones. Bones. Breasts Breasts Boodle Boodle Cut 
canonical canonical contenders contenders correspondence correspondence delusional delusional detached detached domestic argument domestic argument earlobes earlobes evidence evidence explosion explosion extraction extraction eyelids eyelids handiwork handiwork injuries injuries intestines intestines jagged jagged kidney kidney liver liver mustache mustache mutilation mutilation naked naked occasional occasional organs organs paranoid paranoid petite petite prostitute prostitute released released schizophrenia schizophrenia separations separations significance significance slashed slashed
sliced sliced smeared smeared spleen spleen stabbed stabbed suspects suspects testimony testimony tissue tissue trace trace uterus uterus vagina vagina vertebrae vertebrae violent violent So, end of our first episode, Jack the Reaper. The next episode will be presented to you soon. Stay tuned!